Okay, Shabbat Shalom and welcome. Um, this is our Sabbath morning study, and I'm glad to be here with you today. Wanted to make a couple of announcements before I get into the teaching this morning. The first of which is uh, James and I have a couple of spots still open for our tour. Technically, all of the hotel reservations have been made, and they're telling us that it would be very difficult and to not make a big push out on the Internet because things have wrapped up. You know, the tour is in 33 days, I believe, 33, 34 days. So if you intend on going, um, you need to do that soon and let me know because uh, we'll have to push that a little bit, uh, make sure it goes through. But so that's the first announcement, the tour of Israel. Now, I actually leave February the 20th. And uh, I'll be gone until March the 13th. But I've got plans to teach while I'm in Israel so the local group can hook up the TV like they did maybe and do that kind of thing. But as I understand, uh, Dave and Sherry are going to be in Israel too. So we're going to have to figure that out. Everybody's going, except, and you, it's not too late, John. Come on. Anyway, uh, the other thing is that the other announcement I have is that we have our United Israel Conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, in April, the last weekend of April, on the United Israel website, there is a beautiful conference page with a registration uh, form and everything. So I need you to understand, I've gotten a few emails from people that say, we're coming. Well, if I have that message from you, that's great, but I also need you to go online and register because that helps us determine how many people we have and we can make you a beautiful name tag and, and so forth and so on. So I need you to register if you're coming. It's going to be a wonderful time together. We are celebrating our 75th annual conference and meeting. So this is a big deal. Most organizations don't last 75 years. And not only have we lasted, but in many decades now, we've thrived and things are on sort of an incline now. Things are really happening at United Israel. So we're hoping that many of you uh, can make it to Charlotte for that conference. So unitedisrael.org, go up to the top, you'll see news and events, and on that you will see very clearly the annual conference link. So do that. Maybe someone can post that link for me. We are currently in a study that I hesitated to give a title to because what I really wanted was to be led by God and to move into whatever it was that I felt inspired to teach. So I called the quote-unquote series Prophecy and Prophets, or something like that. You might remember. And while this connects with prophets and prophecy, it is something that I feel really impressed to talk about today, and you'll see why. Um, but to make the connection, I'll start this morning by touching on a couple of things as we enter into my lesson this morning, and that is that prophecy is the chosen method per our recent inquiry whereby God, the Creator, Jehovah, communicates His intentions, His will, His word to His people. And we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. We've really stressed certain points. We've gone through certain texts. We've talked about not only is this the preferred method and the method whereby God communicates to His people? But we've also made it very clear that the people didn't listen. And uh, that's the sad part about the story. And remember, they said to Moses, we don't want to hear God anymore. We want you to go hear from God. And then you bring the message to us because we're afraid we're going to die. Moses agrees with it. God even says it's a good idea. And so the prophecy method of communication goes forward. Um, the one who brings this message is referred to biblically in the English Bible by the word prophet. Prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. 
not like modern ministers, P-R-O-F-I-T. These are people who bring the message. Now, but the English word prophet is representative of a Hebrew idea that is encapsulated, if you will, in the word navi. And we're going to be talking about English words versus what they really mean in Hebrew because what we tend to do in our English language or in any language when translating from the biblical text, we come up with an, uh, a word that is not always an accurate picture of what the Hebrew is trying to tell us. Now, I want to begin this morning by telling you that the first one who is called a Navi, a prophet, is Abraham. Now, you'll recall in 1 Samuel 9, 9, uh, check me on that, 1 Samuel 9, 9 says that those who were originally called, or who are now called a prophet, a Navi, were originally called a seer. <clears throat> so it kind of it makes you think that the term didn't come about until much later in the biblical history period. But actually, am I right, John? Yep. See there? Give me an A and let's move on. So the idea, though, <clears throat> is that uh, I want to begin with this idea that Abraham is the first. Now, a lot of you have heard this. I don't know where this rule is written, but there is a rule in biblical studies that at least is in my mind that whenever I study a topic, I want to get a feel for the first time it's used and then I follow it through. I look at the word not only in the biblical literature, but I look at it in other ancient sources as best I can. I investigate it in the original language and so forth. What you will find if you search for the English word prophet, it will take you to Genesis chapter 20, which we'll go there in a moment. Um, but if you look at the Hebrew, it says that Abraham is called a Navi. Now, I don't want to begin in Genesis 20. What I want to begin with is Isaiah chapter 51. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 51. Again, people ask me, what translation are you using? I'm currently reading to you from um, an RSV, but there are times where I will pull up uh, the Hebrew and look at it directly on my screen. So Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2. Hearken to me, you who pursue righteousness... You who seek Jehovah, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. The idea that I want to draw your attention to is not only in our present study, but quite often... Whenever we want to study a certain matter related to faith, we ought to look to Abraham. Abraham is respected by all three great monotheistic faiths. I say great in the sense of size and dominance in the world today. Both Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all look to Abraham and consider his faith as the model for humanity. Abraham comes before there is a Judaism, before there is even the term Jew, before there is an Israelite, before there is a Christianity, before there is, you get the picture. So if we want to trace it back, now I suppose that this uh, applies to you because I just said those who pursue, literally radaf is to chase after, if you're pursuing righteousness... If you are seeking Jehovah, look to Abraham. So we're going to go this morning to Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. We're going to do what Isaiah tells us to do. And it happens to play in perfectly to my class this morning. 
Genesis chapter 20. Now, let me give you a little context here. In Genesis chapter 20, Avraham is journeying towards the Negev. He's going uh, down into that desert region between uh, Kadesh and Shur. You can look at a biblical map and you can, uh, you can see and trace their journey. And he comes to a place called Gerar. Uh, Gerar. And uh, he's got this idea that his wife is beautiful and if he doesn't somehow suggest that she's not his wife, that the people of the place will take his woman, right? So they come up with this plan to where he says to people, this is my sister. Now, later in the story you read, technically it's his brother's daughter, you know, and he's like, she's kind of my sister, like, all right. But what we see in this story is he tells uh, the people of the place that this is my sister. So God, and so what happens is the king of Gerar finds and sees this beautiful woman and takes her. Now, we don't get a lot of the details of this, but he brings her into his place. And, um, and, and so this is where I want to pick up in verse 3 of chapter 20 of Genesis. God came to Avimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you're a dead man. Now, Sherry, you had a dream last night, but it wasn't like this. It was a very sweet dream, right? Well, this is not a good dream. You are a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she's a man's woman. And Avimelech, um, had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you slay an innocent people? I'm going to read the English and I'll get into a little bit of the Hebrew in a minute. Um, Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Now, just so you understand... Um, this is a pagan dream, a pagan king. A pagan let, may not be the right word. It is a, uh, a, a king of the nations. He's a Gentile. All right. So what we have here is God is speaking to a king outside of the people he will choose. Do you get that? All right. And notice in the dream... This is presented as a real communication, a two-way communication, and we find Avimelech is able to talk back to God in this dream, right? Interesting. Okay. Verse 6, Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I didn't let you touch her. Now, restore the man's wife then, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore, know that you shall surely die, you and all that are yours. Right? Now, you can imagine when Avimelech wakes up, He's probably in a pretty big hurry to get this straight. He puts uh, his trust in the dream that he had. And I want to focus a little bit on that last verse, that verse 7 that we read. He says to him, um, make, you need to make this right, leading up to this, you need to make this right uh, because, why do you need to fix this? It's a man's wife. You need to fix this because he's a prophet, a Navi. Now, it says he will pray for you and you will live. If you don't do this, you're going to die. Not only you, but all that are yours. Now, I want you to look with me. Many of you know this verse, but go, uh, go to Psalm 105. Let me tell you, it's it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a terrible God. 105, Psalm 105. 
beginning in uh, verse 12. When they were few in number, of little account and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my messiahs, do my prophets no harm. Now the psalmist is referring to a situation as I've described from Genesis 20. It says that he, um, he told him, don't, don't you hurt her, don't you touch her. Now, one of the points that I want to make is that the first mention in Scripture of prophets, so people said, are you still talking about prophets and prophecy, or did you already get off of that, Ross? My gosh, you're all over the place. Uh, I, can, I can use the word prophet. It's part of the prophet series. The very first thing we hear about a prophet is what I'm going to cover today. Notice this. It says that he'll pray for you. Now, that's not normally the first thing that comes to mind. If I say prophet, what do you think about? We think of things like the future, a uh, little bit of prediction, oracles, the burden of Jehovah came unto me, the word of the Lord came unto me. We talk about denouncements of uh, nations who hurt God's people. We think about all those things. But what we don't typically think about is prayer. This is the first mention of prophet. It's also, my friends, the first mention of prayer. The first time that the word which is translated prayer is used in Scripture, is right here, and it's associated with a prophet. So here's the thing I want you to get today. You say prophet, you think prayer. You say prayer, you think prophet. Bear with me. Um, Jehovah puts Avimelech's life in his own hands. He's got a choice. This is the way God does it. I put before you life and blessing death and cursing. Choose life. He does that with other people too, right? This is a Gentile king. Um, Jehovah speaks to a Gentile king, and I think this is quite significant. Uh, the Gentile king does heed the word. Now, I want you to look with me down Genesis chapter 20. I want you to look down with me to verse 17. In other words, he, he does restore the wife. And then here's, so that's the context. He gives the woman back. He's a, in fact, he does say, why did you do this to me? Why did you, you told me that this was your sister. I could have been injured. I mean, this is a bad deal. Uh, look at verse 17. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Avimelech. And he also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For Jehovah had closed all the wombs uh, of the house of Avimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, Abraham's woman. Now, we don't get the words to Abraham's prayer. We only see, according to the narrative, that he did pray for Avimelech. And here's what we know. The prayer worked, right? Everyone agree? The prayer worked. Um, so now we have the first reference to Navi, the first reference to prayer, and to my knowledge, the first reference in the biblical text to divine healing all tied together in one story. We have this two-way communication between God and a human, and it's, it's in a dream state. And in the dream, there is two-way communication. This is very important. So this is not the only time. It's, it's uh, mentioned in other places. Remember in Genesis 28, 
where Jacob has a dream. He's on the way. He's leaving. His brother's trying to kill him. He lays down the rock. You have the ladder, the sulam, and he has a dream, and he speaks back and forth with God. Um, 1 Kings chapter 3, I like to bring this one up. In 1 Kings 3, you remember the story where Solomon, um, uh, God says, What can I do for you, Solomon? And Solomon asked for wisdom to lead God's people. And God said, Because you asked for wisdom and not riches and all these other things, I'm going to give you wisdom and all of that. Did you know all that took place in a dream? 1 Kings chapter 3. Now, we tend to think of these encounters as uh, a, a lively, awakened state, but they take place in dreams, which is what it says in Numbers chapter 12. That's the way God is going to communicate with his people. If there be a prophet among you, I will make myself known unto him. Remember that? Okay. So now we start seeing how this is coming together. So he speaks to a Gentile king, and he tells him, this is God, you're a dead man. Now, Avi Melech, in the dream, brings forward a case. You know what he says? Now, first of all, the narrator tells us, but Avi Melech hadn't touched her. That's an important part. Mm -hmm. He hasn't uh, touched her at all, and so the narrator lets us know that. The next thing we read is, uh, is his response. Now, I will tell you this. I, I looked at Josephus in, in his account. Josephus doesn't, um, doesn't give us all the same details as the Bible, but sometimes as the historian, I find some interesting points in there. Basically, Josephus tells us that God had stricken Avimelech so heavily that he couldn't have touched her if he wanted to, right? I mean, just, he made it impossible. The text in the Bible hints at this, but Josephus really draws that out from probably traditional stories that had come down. Now, I like what Avimelech says. Avimelech says, Adonai, will you kill a righteous Gentile? That's what he says. Now, what does it say in, uh, in the English? Um, it's, it's wrong, but in the English here, it says um, um, something about, will you destroy a royal nation or something, right? Righteous yeah, righteous nation. So clearly, but it really just says, um, will you destroy a righteous Gentile? Now, he goes on to make his case. He says, look, the guy gave me a sister story, and she gave me a brother story. I didn't know. I mean, he's got a good point, right? He does. He really does. And he says, he talks about Avimelech in the dream in the conversation with God. He says, uh, but Tom, in, in the uh, perfection of my heart, in the wholeness of my heart. Remember this word, tam? We talk about tamim, tam, to be complete, to be whole, to be perfect, without blemish. It's used of Noah. It says Noah was an ish tamim, or ish tam in his generation. Abraham is told in Genesis 17, walk before me and be tam, be whole, be complete, be... So Avimelech says, uh, in my heart I was complete, perfect, without fault. And then he says something that I think is a key point. He says, what I did, I did in the innocency of my hands. He's saying, I, I know it looks bad. Now that I know that I have another man's woman, it's pretty clear. But I didn't know that. Now, the same God that just told him you're a dead man tells him, I know. Let that sink in. I know. And I kept you from touching her. Now get her back. 
It's all in Genesis 20. So, Sarah is returned. And uh, Abraham prays, and everything is good. Lives are saved. People are healed. Gentiles, by the way. And wounds are opened. Now, here's something that hit me last night. Uh, Look at chapter 20, verse 18. Uh, For Jehovah had closed all the wounds of the house of Avimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. Jehovah visited Sarah as he said, and Jehovah did to Sarah as he had promised, and Sarah conceived. Guess who else's womb is opened right after this prayer? I never really thought about this. We don't know what Abraham prayed, but we do know that whatever he prayed, it restored the life of Avimelech. It opened the womb of the people who had previously been closed in Gerar, and it opened Sarah's womb. I have a couple of thoughts. Either Abraham prayed, open these wombs, and by the way, Please, fulfill your word. Now, it doesn't say that. I'm clear to make that point. But I do find it interesting that when Abraham the prophet, the Navi, prays a prayer that brings life and healing and restoration to wounds for another, his own situation is taken care of. Just think about that. So my question today is, what do we learn um, from all of this? What do we learn in terms of prophets and prayer? And what's the significance of the fact that the first time prophet is used, prayer is there. The first time prayer is used, prophet is there. The first time both of them come together, there is healing I want to tell you something that's been on my heart. A disparity exists. There is, for me, a difference between the stories of which I am very, very familiar in the modern faith walk. I know the Bible. You know the Bible. When I read these stories, this is my passion. This is my life. This is my heart. And when I read these stories, I say, Epho Ata, where are you? Like Isaiah 63, where is the God that led those people out of Egypt? Just being honest. I see a great difference. I see a great disparity between uh, the faith that is demonstrated in the Bible and religions that claim to be based on the Bible. And I am not excluding any. There are people within Christianity who would tell me, well, my faith is based on the Bible, and the reason you don't see these things is because you're not sided with me. And there are Jews who say, my faith is based on the Bible, and I was here first. And the reason you don't see these, whatever it is you're looking for, is because you're, let let me tell you something, ne'er one of these groups, none, match the faith walk that's described in the Bible. And if I, I pray that you're not offended by that, I pray that you're willing to look at it and shake your head yes, because that is a true statement. Prayer for me is a case in point. This is, I'm I'm teaching me and you just happen to be listening. So understand that. I have begun to 
really realize, recognize, and finally admit that my prayer life is lacking. Mine is. I don't know about yours. Yours may not. My prayer life is lacking, and it has been for some time. Now, I can take you probably based on memory, and don't don't think I'm boasting here. This is not what I'm saying. I could sit down with you at this table and go through every single prayer in order in the Bible. I could probably do that and score pretty high. I can quote portions of those prayers. And they're beautiful prayers. I've read them. I've taught them. And I can sort of grab hold of those and say, along with the person who originally said it. But until recently, like real recently, like this week, I've not made prayer a priority. I'm not saying I don't pray. I'm not saying that I haven't prayed in the last couple of decades. What I'm saying is that it has not been a priority for me. So I had to ask myself some very tough questions. Um, And what are those questions? The first question is, why? Why is this? Why is my prayer life lacking? Has my faith, this is my question to me, has my faith become an intellectual pursuit primarily. Like if you, if, if you said, well, what's your diet? I could say, my diet's biblical. I can base my, my diet on the biblical text and I can find reason for doing that. What about your holiday? Yep, biblical, yep. You wear a seat, seat, yep, yep. You grow a beard, yep. I mean, I could go down a list of external things that I do and things that I eat, and things that I believe, and yeah, my head, I mean, I've got some beliefs that I think are probably pretty accurate according to the biblical text. I think my doctrines and my dogma are pretty square. I think that if I sat down with most people who would argue against me, I would have the Bible on my side. And you know what I'm thinking now? A lot of that doesn't really matter probably. If I've got this deficit in my prayer life, because here's what's hitting me now, and I'm sharing it in the event that you might benefit from it as well. Most relationship problems are due to what? A lack of communication. Imagine if a husband or wife Ask the other one, why aren't we intimate? The other one could say, in most situations, you don't even talk to me. Right? And I think that that is something that we can take from this situation and compare it with our faith. Now, Here's the beauty of this. If in a personal relationship that difficulty is there, that barrier, no matter how many years or weeks or months or decades it's gone on, we should be willing to forgive and start to communicate and open those channels rather than just say, well, you didn't talk to me for that long, so you'll never be never be close to you. We have to be able to make reparation for that. So how does that start? Starts when we talk. Starts when we listen. Communication can begin in any time like that. What I am presenting is for me, but I hope it resonates with you as well. Many religious groups 
have established um, um, formalized prayers and corporate prayer. Okay, look, here you can see on my desk here, I've got a few prayer books. Now, I just pulled in just a couple of them. Those of you who've been to my office know I've got a whole shelf of these. I could have a garage sale and, and uh, get rid of most of these. In fact, I probably should. That's another point. But I have a lot of prayer books, and um, I've got books behind me. My prayer, part one and two, that's probably 600 pages right there to teach me how to pray. Um, there, are, there are whole volumes that I have on how we are to approach God, how we are to uh, get that communication going. Now, let me say this because I don't want to offend. If someone uses any one of these prayer books uh, and you feel that it benefits you and you feel that it draws you close to God, please don't get me wrong. I, I wish you the best. All right? But, but I, think, I think the intent of the authors of these books, the intent of the organization of the organized prayers, for instance, in Judaism, are well-intended, right? Now, I happen to know from studies in, uh, by academics in prayer uh, or studying the subject of prayer that originally these benedictions and so forth that people follow weren't spelled out quite as much. They were just headings to kind of keep you flowing. You know, like how do you start your prayer? You, you begin with this and you work your way through. But it was supplied by the prayer, right? Prayer, the one who prays. So I have these prayer books, and, and I do have a favorite, I'll tell you. When I, when I pick this one up, this is Spiral Bound. I downloaded it for free. And, and look, I'm not, don't try to put me in a box by this, but it's called a Careite Prayer Book. I love this book. It's so beautiful. You know why I like it? Because it's full of Bible verses. So in essence, when I've picked this up in times past, I've given God story time. I've read his own verses to him. Now, I know that might sound pretty harsh, but it's true. Blessed be you, you know, and I go through and I start to read. Oh, Jehovah, hear my prayer and let my cry come unto thee. That's Psalm 102, verse 2. I will bless thee at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall glory in Jehovah. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify Jehovah with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought Jehovah and he answered me. And you know how long it takes to do the morning prayers in this one? This is a Karite book. About 43 minutes. Evening prayers, roughly the same. I love that prayer book because I love Scripture. But it's not personal. If I go to the store, again, now this is what I've been telling myself all week, so don't, don't be offended. But when I go to the store, if I get a card, a Hallmark card, and it's a pretty card, and it fits the person I'm giving it to, that's sweet, isn't it? I mean, it is nice. People love to get a card. Even if it's appropriate for the situation for which I get it. Get well soon. You know, whatever. And, I, and then I put, with love, Ross. The only part of that on, is my little signature, and I give it to whoever, Sherry or Bridget or whoever. In a, some way, I feel like these represent Hallmark cards to Jehovah that we close with love, Ross. So I had to make a decision. My decision, um, my decision was to fix this deficiency. Now, my desire is to go beyond a head knowledge of prayer 
and to actually put into practice to make prayer a priority. Having said that, I want to start by telling you that as always, I start any study from the words in connection with the words and on the basis of the words. So while I don't want to be so formulaic and I don't want to be so strict in this, I also wanted to look at what is, what is it when we read in the Bible about prayer, what does that look like? Does it look like the formalized prayer sessions that we currently take part in? And I've got a few things to share with you this morning. So the first thing I want to do is, is talk to you about this. What is prayer? What is prayer? Uh, it's an English word used to represent no less than six different Hebrew words um, that are supplied by the translators under the one word prayer. In other words, if you look up prayer and you say, dear computer system, great all uh, uh, knowing Bible works or accordance, give me every occurrence of the English word prayer, and you look them up, which I did, you'll see that sometimes it's translating one word, sometimes it's translating another, and so forth and so on. The primary word that is translated as prayer in Hebrew is the word tefillah. Tefillah. Grammatically, now everyone just take a break and relax because I've just got one sentence that'll roll right through most people and you just have to write it down. But grammatically, it's, it's called the reflex of the verb hit palel. And everybody says, who cares? But what does that mean? Its basic meaning is to seek judgment for oneself. It, it has to do, and I'm going I'm to explain a few things that, that I've learned this week because I think they might help us understand. It comes from a root word, palel. Palal, actually, palal. And it means, in its basic meaning... Because it's, it's built on, let me explain this. In Hebrew, words are built on roots. But we do this in English, too. If I take the word one, O-N-E, can you think of other words that mean the same but are slightly different? How about this? Alone, A-L-O-N-E. See, see the O-N-E? Alone is all one. You're all by yourself. How about once? O-N, slide a C in, E. Right? You get this. Only is another word that's tied. These are tied to the root word of one. Prayer, tefillah, is tied to the root word palal. So if we can understand what palal is, we might get a better understanding of the biblical idea behind prayer. All right. So it has to do with uh, to intervene, to interpose. Now, both of these terms have to do, they can imply placing oneself between one person or thing and another, or between one event or, or series of events or course of events and another. I'm going to illustrate some of this. It covers a wide variety of ideas such as arbitrate, judgment, uh, mediation, separation. In fact, in Hebrew, the word palil, you hear it sounds like palal. A palil is an umpire. What does an umpire do? An umpire gets in the middle of things. And, and they will, if you think, even in baseball, right? Watches this event, watches this event, makes a decision. I'm trying to cover the basic meaning. Now, you might say, if I said, what is prayer? You know what people would say, talking to God. Okay, well, that's good. You got it. 
You got it. What I'm trying to do is go beyond just so people understand the meaning that is embedded in what is the Bible saying when it talks about prayer. How, not that we have to think a certain, you know, I got to make, but I want people to understand it in its context, biblically. A prayer, um, meaning one who prays, is one who finds him or herself in the middle. In the middle. Now, this, I think, is essential. So, for instance, a prayer of thanks. I'm going to give you some practical examples. A prayer of thanks might be offered if I recognize that an event could have been really bad, but it was turned to good. Now, what does it mean to pray about this? So, get this. I'm in the middle of two events, two possibilities, and I say, Yehovah, I thank you, most he- gracious Heavenly Father, because this could have been very bad and you turned it good. You see, I'm, I'm in the middle of a decision here, or if I know of two possible outcomes, I'm going to get a test. I'm greatly worried about this. Yehovah, please, in your mercy, it could be this, but I don't even want to think about that. I w- you see? The idea is that you're an arbiter, you're a decision maker, you're in the middle of these two things. Could be two people, right? Okay. Now, I want you to go. I'm going to give a couple of examples. Go with me to Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 30. Oh, I love me some Deuteronomy. I throw out Deuteronomy sometimes. I'm not even in it. Deuteronomy, uh, Genesis 30. Genesis 30, verse 6. Then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my, some translations say prayer, but in Hebrew it's, it's voice. God has heard my voice and given me a son, therefore she called his name Dan. What Rachel is telling us is that Rachel called out to God about a situation that she had. You know what it was? She was barren. She wanted children. She puts herself in the middle of those two places. Here I am. Here's where I want to be. I'm going to pray. I'm going to call out to God to decide in my favor. And she says that, notice, judgment was rendered. Now, it's a different Hebrew word. It's dine. But judgment was rendered on her behalf. Now, let's talk just a moment about who can pray. Is Rachel a priest? No. Is Rachel a prophet? No. Rachel is a common person. Um, We're going to very shortly read about her carrying idols in her knapsack. Right? I mean, we are. Now, let me show you how this starts off, because a lot of people will say, the reason your prayers aren't answered is because your heart's not right. You're holding a grudge. You're holding it. Look at this. Verse 1, chapter 30. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. So she got some envy going on there. A lot of preachers will tell you you can't get a prayer answered if you got that envy, Pam. You got to get rid of that. And... She said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God? She's she's arguing with her husband. She's got envy. You know, that is not a good recipe for an answered prayer, right? My point being, some of the preconceptions that we might have might not be right, biblically speaking. Okay. Okay. But when she names her son um, through the handmaid, Dan, she says that God has rendered judgment in her favor between these two situations, right? Um, Now, prayer in brief is presenting um, a case or a cause to Jehovah. For oneself or another seeking judgment or a decision. There are different forms of prayer. You have uh, petition, confession, adoration, thanks, 
You, you might pray for vengeance on your enemies. Have you ever done that? I have. All right. Because you, it says like 32 times in Scripture that vengeance belongs to Jehovah. So if you need something, you know. Now, y'all are probably too holy to do that. Strike that I said I've done that. A uh, little blemish on my character, right? Well, David said, kick my enemy's teeth out. I prayed that. But the circumstances, the needs, uh, situations in one's life can drive one to pray. All right? One does not need to be a part of a high social class or special order, just common people. Now, Stats outside of the Psalms, which are often called uh, the Bible's prayer book, according to a book that I just read a couple of days ago by Moshe Greenberg, it's called Biblical Prose Prayer. He says that uh, prayers are praying, prayers or praying mentioned more than 140 times outside of the book of Psalms. 140 times. Now, of those, about half of them simply mention praying or prayer, and the other half, roughly, mention wording in prayers, okay? So it's kind of half and half there. Now, of these prayers, according to his research, and I am actually counting because I'm still studying this, 38 of these prayers are by lay people, just regular people. They're not a priest, they're not a prophet, they're not a king, um, 59 of them, according to Moshe Greenberg, are uh, by kings, prophets, and leaders. Now, listen to this closely. In biblical literature, there are times when prayers are answered, and there are times when prayers are not answered. So does Ross have a pattern or a model whereby if you pray, your prayers will be guaranteed to be answered? No. And guess who else doesn't have uh, that model? None of you. Not a one. Now, I know there's some people who say, well, I'm telling you every prayer I've ever prayed has been answered, and, and that may be the case. But I would, I would guess that most of us, because the biblical literature says the same. In fact, did you know there are times when uh, a prophet is told not to pray? Look at Jeremiah. Let me give you a couple of these. Jeremiah chapter 7. I'm studying the prophets right now, so some of this is pretty fresh. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. As for you, Jeremiah seven sixteen. Do not pray for this people or lift up cry or prayer for them. Do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. He's talking to Jeremiah. Look at chapter 11. Jeremiah eleven fourteen. Therefore, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. Now, let me tell you, during this time, wasn't happening. It's what we, in contemporary thought, will sometimes call our heavens are brass, or our heavens are iron. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and uh, verse 23, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19, they flip that, but it's in the curses of the law, if you will, that your heavens will be brass and your earth will be iron. In other words, you can't dig, you can't dig down, you can't penetrate the heavens. Imagine brass or iron heavens. It's like you, you can't get through, see? That's the image that we associate with that. Now, other people say, well, that's not what that means. But it's an image I want you to understand, right? Now, I don't suggest that we can study our way into an effective prayer life. Because if we could, I'd be raising the dead. I'm not lying. I mean, if you could study your way into an effective prayer life, most of you here, people would be 
calling and, you know, trying to get you to cut off a piece of your handkerchief for them. That's what they'd be doing. But you can't. See, that's not, that's not, there are times even when a Jeremiah is told, don't you pray. It's not going to work because I'm not going to listen. If it happened to Jeremiah, all right, you get the point. But I do think that there are some texts um, that go in the favor of some who pray or for whom favor is granted when they or another prays for them. In other words, there are certain examples in Scripture which probably, evidently, put us in a better place. Now, let me start with a couple of ideas. Innocency of hands, you know, if you're not guilty... You're praying um, righteousness and sincerity. Innocency, right, innocency, righteousness, and sincerity. Uh, as in the case of Avi Melech. Now look at Proverbs. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15 and verse 29. Proverbs 15, 29. Jehovah is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. That's a beautiful proverb. It's not always true. Well, let me say that again. Strike that. It is true that he hears, unless like in Jeremiah, he said, I won't hear. But does he listen? You know, I was telling somebody the other day, one, one day I was at work and two guys were having a discussion, and one of them said, you never listen to me. You just never listen to me. That's why I'm so mad. And the guy said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not that I don't listen to you. You think that I don't listen to you because I don't do what you want me to do. I hear you fine. And that struck me. So sometimes God hears you. You know, so, Have you ever heard the expression, you know, I prayed and God didn't answer it. Well, maybe that was your answer, right? So anyway, the idea, though, is that generally, Jehovah is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Now look at Psalm um, 145, Psalm 145, verse 18. 145, verse 18. Jehovah is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Or in sincerity, right? The idea is that if you're sincere, if you're righteous, that God hears your prayers. Now this, this I love this passage. It's one of my favorite verses because it, it says he's clearly um, near to all, A-L-L, who call on him in sincerity and truth. Now, let's pull in a prophet here. Go to Hosea. Hosea chapter 14. And verse 1. Hosea 14, 1. Return, O Israel, to Jehovah your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words... And return to Jehovah. Say to him, take away all iniquity except that which is good, and we will render the fruit of our lips. Some translations say the calves. In other words, prayer represents a sacrifice. It's something you are bringing to God. And it substitutes for that. Right? Bring with you words. It's a beautiful image. Another story that I want to relate to you is this idea of being heartfelt. It's related. Innocent, righteous, sincere, heartfelt. You remember the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel? Go with me to 1 Samuel. We're going to touch on this. 1 Samuel... Um, Chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now, the story is this. Uh, Hannah 
is unable, she doesn't have children. And um, so she's really desiring children. Her situation is, Panina, the other woman, has children. And, and she's kind of making it rough on Hannah, who doesn't. Hannah wants children. Hannah prays for children. She is distraught over this. And her husband says, well, you do have me. That sounds like something stupid a husband would say. You do have me. I mean, I'm better than ten sons. You know, and she probably wanted to crack him in the face. But she's hurt over this. So she goes, just like the custom was, you know that was true, she goes like the custom was to the tabernacle, and she's going to pray. Now, uh, here we go, verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now, Eli, Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of Jehovah. Imagine, big old priest, and he's looking at this woman. She was deeply distressed and prayed to Jehovah and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Jehovah of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give to your maidservant a son, and I'll give him to Jehovah all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before Jehovah, now I'm going to take a break for a second and tell you this, here is your religious leader going to step in and you tell me if you think he had great insight or not. It's what religious leaders do all the time. They mess up. Eli observed her mouth. He's watching, see, because he's a religious police. He's watching her lips move. And Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, being the observant priest that he is, took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you be drunken? Put away that wine from you. This is the priest. Put away that wine from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman sorely troubled. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before Jehovah. And let me tell you this, Eli wouldn't recognize pouring out the soul before God because he hadn't seen it in a long time. Not in his own life, not in the life of his sons. He didn't even know what she was doing. That ought to tell us something. How many religious leaders are like that? Do not regard your maidservant as a base woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, now he's going to be, oh. He says, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have made to him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her countenance was no longer sad. Let me tell you what I think. I think that Samuel's blessing on her and let God answer your prayer had not a damn thing to do with the prayer being answered. Eli. What? Eli, no. Samuel. Samuel. I meant Eli. Now, the truth is, I don't think that his, okay, yeah, let it be answered. I don't think it had anything at all to do with the prayer being answered. What had to do with the prayer being answered is, she is pouring out her soul. She is crying from the depths of her being. Now, to pour out one's heart does not necessarily mean that you'll be heard on high even then. Look at Jeremiah, I'm, I'm sorry, look at Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. Just to give you an example. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to Him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Jehovah, and see. 
I mean, it goes on and on. You read, you've read Lamentation. The call is to pour out your soul. But you see, it, it didn't, didn't do. It didn't work. There are times in the Bible when prayer works, and there are times in the Bible when prayer doesn't work. And that's a fact. Now, could we come up with a methodology whereby we could guarantee that our prayers could be answered? Uh Uh-uh. I don't think so. What if we... What if we put a prayer shawl on? What if... What if we stand a certain way? What if we bow a certain number of times? And what if we do it every day? Is that what God's looking for? Do you think Hannah had her prayer book with her at Biblical Shiloh? In Psalm 55, Psalm 55, David <clears throat> says in verse 1, Give ear to my prayer, O God. And he says that a lot in a lot of these psalms. Give ear to my prayer, O God. In verse 17, <clears throat> 16 the Hebrew is going to be a little bit different. I'm reading 16 and 17 in English. In Hebrew, it's going to be 17 and 18. David says, But I call upon God, and Jehovah will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he will hear my voice. And David says he prays three times a day. Evening, morning, and noon. Where else have we heard this? Mm -hmm. Daniel, right? So you can go to Daniel in chapter 6, verse 10. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, we read similarly that Daniel prayed three times a day, and the situation wasn't good in Daniel's time because they said you got to pray to this idol, and if you don't pray to the idol, we're going to, you know, And he went to his window every day. Look at chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Three times a day. Morning, evening, and noon. Facing Jerusalem. Right? Now, is it only during these organized times? So get, don't get me wrong. I think that praying three times a day facing Jerusalem is a wonderful idea. I really do. I mean, it, it orients us. And, and we can think and we can focus and we can... So, so I'm not knocking that, but is that how you pray all the time? Is that how these biblical prayers are always offered? I'll give you an example. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, go with me to 2 Samuel 15. I'm going to give you an example of uh, a prayer um, that's a little bit different. Look at uh, verse 30. <clears throat> and David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. When we go to Israel, we always do this walk on the Mount of Olives, and we talk about this story. David is going up the Mount of Olives. He's walking. He's got his whole procession with him. Everyone's weeping, and he's barefoot. His head's covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. And it was told to David... Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So in other words, they're, they're worried because they know that uh, the possibility is Absalom is going to come take over and so forth, so they're leaving. And, and now he finds out Ahithophel is with them. Now watch his prayer in verse 31. This is a prayer. 
Uh, and David said, O Jehovah, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. You see that? That's a prayer. Not a long one. I mean, it really isn't. He says to Jehovah, now did he do this out loud? I don't know. I, I have no way it doesn't say it. But it does say, it's, it's like you picture as you read the story. Someone said, David, David, Ahithophel's in the council of Absalom. And he says, Jehovah, turn the council of Ahithophel on his head. Make it into foolishness. Now, when it comes to prayer, it doesn't matter how big it is. How many of you remember a couple of years ago the book, I, I never got it, uh, but it was called uh, The Prayer of Jabez. You remember that? It was put out, Christians were talking about it. And, and uh, again, I didn't read it, but I, do, I have read The Prayer of Jabez, not the book, The Real Prayer. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. Let me give you another good little short prayer. Jabez, 1 Chronicles 4, 10 called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me and enlarge my border, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from harm, so that it might not hurt me. And God granted what he asked. Amen. How about that? We don't get a lot more brief than that. About Moses. In Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verse 13. Um, well, we'll start in verse 11. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we've done foolishly and have sinned. Let her, meaning Miriam, who's been stricken with leprosy, not be as one of the dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to Jehovah, Heal her, O God, I beseech thee. Very short. That's his prayer. You can almost imagine him looking at him like, that's it? What, what's he doing? He's calling out to God with a specific need. Now, it's the quantity isn't the important thing. It's the quality. Right? You, you know, a lot of times people think that. Have you ever been at a, tr a Thanksgiving dinner or something and they call on that one uncle that's got the deep voice that will pray until you are like, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, I am so hungry right now. And, the, and he just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I can't help but think, surely... Uh, this is a little bit over the top. It's not necessarily that by multiplying our words that God is going to hear us. My own studies of prayer in the Bible continue. And one of the things that I'm looking at is what can we do in terms of prayer, let me, let me make it clear this, this point too. If you didn't know that the Hebrew word for prayer was tefillah, that doesn't mean that God won't hear your prayer. There are people all over this world who draw near to God in sincerity and God hears their prayer and they don't know Hebrew and they don't need to know Hebrew and God doesn't care either. Make that point clear. I brought these points up because I want to get at the idea of what should I be doing? What is prayer? I mean, it's sad when you think about it, you know, to spend 30 years in study and know all about prayer from a biblical point and say, you know, as important as it is in the Bible, my prayer life is hurting and then have to go back through this. So thanks for bearing with me, but a couple of points as I conclude today's class. Here's some things that I've learned. Don't be prescriptive, Ross. Don't, don't be prescriptive. Look, 
God can hear anyone at any time in any place. They don't have to be a Jew. They don't have to be an Israelite, a lost tribe, or an Ephraimite, or a Hebrew roots, a Messianic believer, a B'nai Noah. Uh, the list goes on. The person that God hears does not have to look like, act like, or be like you or me. God gets to choose who he hears and who he doesn't hear. They don't have to be facing the east. They don't have to be standing on a certain foot. They don't have to have a prayer shawl. They don't have to be a priest, a prophet, a Levite, a king. And if they are a king, they can be from another nation. The king of Gerar is where we started. 1 Kings 8 is the dedication, Solomon's dedication of the temple. <clears throat> and I just want to pick up a couple of passages. Um, 1 Kings 8, verse 30. And hearken thou to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Yea, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hear, forgive. And he goes on and he describes various situations that the people will find themselves in and will ultimately call out uh, to God. In other words, after this verse, it lists uh, there are several, it's followed by several calamitous things. When there's famine, when they're this, when they're that, when they get defeated before their enemy and they cry out and they call to you, here, this is Solomon's prayer about uh, this house. Now look at this, verse 41. Likewise, when a foreigner, wait a minute, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to see in order that all the people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee as do thy people Israel and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. This week, uh, no, I'm not going to get specific. There are people who will say that God is not going to hear the prayers of foreigners. That it angers God that these people go to Jerusalem and pray towards this place. Nonsense. And you might say, well, yeah, but they're bringing their pagan beliefs to this holy area. Who else does God want to come to that area? He's drawing these people out of where they are. Let's let God be God and decide who he hears. I don't want that job. I don't want to get involved in that, and I don't think anybody should. But there are some arrogant people who think they know everything and who think that they're God's gatekeeper. The king of Gerar might have been an idolater. I don't know. God spoke to him. Rachel, Rachel was an idolater. Stole her daddy and a thief. Now, I'm sorry. I mean, biblically. Just stick with me on my point. She takes that which is not hers, and it happens to be the gods of her father. God heard her prayer. David, read Psalm 51, which is written after Nathan tells him, Thou art the man. What does that mean? He had committed adultery, had the husband sent to the front lines and killed. I don't think we have any right to think about being that gatekeeper on who... God listens to and who he doesn't. 
if you look at um, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter seven. Now this is uh, <clears throat> this is a good verse for people looking for revival in their own life or in their country or whatever. Listen to this. Um, verse 14, Second Chronicles 7. <clears throat> if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. That's that thing I'm talking about. Don't come up there with arrogance. If they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, that's a steep order. You know what the toughest part about it is? Humbling ourselves. The rest of it's pretty easy. It's easy to say, well, I'm not going to, you know, commit adultery or steal or murder. But it becomes a little more difficult when we think about humbling ourselves. Because, see, the prophet Micah, now most of you know this, but the prophet Micah says this, and... Uh, Let's look at that. Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Perhaps this is the most important thing in the class. Micah chapter 6, verse 6. With what shall I come before Jehovah and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Jehovah be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does God ask of you? But to do justice, to love loving kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You want to know how God, at least in, in, in some sense, the most uh, appropriate approach to God is this. You can't guarantee that bad things won't happen in your life. You can't guarantee that you will be delivered from every enemy and every bad thing. You can't guarantee that all will be rosy in your life. But I guarantee you this. It's never wrong to approach God in humility. It's never wrong to treat others with respect and without arrogance and this pompous religious spirit that people so often display that I think is a stench in the nostrils of God. We've really got a lot of work to do. I think, obviously, that this class only scratches uh, the surface on this important subject. We can only do our part when it comes to prayer. In other words, it's only our part that we can do. We can't do God's part. So we can seek to align ourselves with God's Word. We can put ourselves in the middle and present our case or the case of another. We should know from whom our help comes, right? Beautiful psalm, right? And we should direct our prayers to Him alone. We should trust that our words are heard, because they are, and we should seek to present them in a heartfelt manner. So if someone says, I'm going to pray three times a day, that's like saying, I'm going to exercise every morning. I encourage you not to say that. I encourage you, I'm looking in a mirror, to say, I want to pray more. I want to seek your face. And as we feel moved and as things come up in our life um, where we feel the urge to pray, pray and pray and pray. Don't commit to something you won't stick with. But I would encourage us all to pray more. Don't think that the quantity of words or time spent in prayer will make our voice to be heard on high. 
It's not about uh, quantity. It's about quality. At least that's the way I understand it. Now, in Solomon's dedication of the temple, he said the following, and I, I am closing now. 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings 8, verse 27. And it says, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. Go with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 and verse 1. Isaiah 66 verse 1. Thus says Jehovah, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house which you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand is made, and so all these things are mine, saith Jehovah. But this is the man to whom I will look. He that is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Jehovah has always desired to have a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56. Remember, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jehovah is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in sincerity, and our prayers are supposed to be as incense, Psalm 141 says. A sweet-smelling incense. Scripture promises these things that we've covered today. I pray that we all make prayer a priority. Shabbat Shalom. So we'll take a few minutes and we'll be back uh, with a dialogue. So check back on our page. We'll have a link.